on warming up, which a lot of people you want to certainly warm the head some because you get, can get condensation in the wind way. But where the tone or where, where the whistle itself needs to be warmed is in the middle of the sound wave in the tube, which is actually under the third hole down. If you plug the other holes, just blow warm air in there, you're warming that. No, that is, so when you're warming up a whistle from the top to the bottom, that it's really warmed up when this area is warmed. Whistles are voiced and tuned at a particular frequency. In this case, a D whistle, you want it to be tuned in at A4, A based on an A440, so that when you play A, it's vibrating at 440 cycles, and that that's where the whistle is in, made to be most in tune when it's playing A440. Now the tuning slide, if someone's a little sharp, the advantage of a tuning slide, of course, if you're playing with an instrument, say a set of pipes or a, a accordion that's A442 or something, it's sharper, you can shorten the whistle slightly and sharpen the whistle and play in tune with that instrument. And although by that time, theoretically, the whistle is slightly out of tune with itself, but you won't hear it within, a, within the smaller ranges that we're talking about. The other advantage is that when the weather gets very hot, whistles tend to go sharp, and you need to be able to pull it out to get it to play at A440. So it, it, the tuning slide is not only for tuning to other instruments that are not playing at A440, it's for making the whistle play at A440 depending on the weather conditions are out, out. If you've got a really, like I say, I've gone and played at sessions uh, where I've got to move my tuning slide you know, a good more than a quarter of an inch in order to bring the, the whistle into tune because of, the, of, because of the, the extreme heat or it's quite warm and, and that's, so now it, it's playing at A440. Or you listen to whatever the concertina or accordion player is playing at and tune to that. And so that's, that's what tuning slides do. Well, uh, I was going to look at a couple of, of wooden whistles. I've got one of my own and my friend BB brought over her new whistle, which is Ebony. Mine is uh, Oz whistle. It's the only wood whistle I actually own. I own a number of metal whistles. Indeed, but I and uh, this one, the this looks like silver and ebony, beautiful looking whistle, and mine is bronze and gidgy wood, made by Oz in Australia. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, we'll give it a little little toot here and see. Responds very nicely. It's an easy, light blowing whistle. Uh, doesn't take a lot of, doesn't want a lot of pressure. It has a fairly narrow pressure range, which means that um, to where you, the pressure it takes or amount of air it takes to get a clear note versus when you've got too much pressure it wants to break and start doing weird things is fairly narrow. It's not. It's not super narrow, but it's kind of a narrow zone between what works and uh, too, between too little and too much. That's his working range. Um, look at this other one. We'll play, play a little bit of the same little run and see if we can hear any difference about it. But. One thing we found out about this whistle, my friend Sean was over here and we both tried it and said yes, and as I go into the upper octave, uh, the ebony whistle goes flat, does not, uh, I cannot blow it up as sharp as it needs to be in the second octave. I'll give it a, make a run up and you can hear, the, hear it on the scale.
quite a disparagement between the uh, the octave balance. This whistle actually probably needs to go back to the maker for an. tune you can really hear it in that and do the same thing on this whistle you'll hear the difference and here that same same figure here quite a bit flatter in the second octave. That is a problem, so therefore I would not play this whistle into the second octave. But I think that, I, I don't know that much about whistle physics, but I know that makers can do a, a lot of things, but that's what I'd suggest for this whistle, that, that it go back to its, uh, who, who made it and uh, to for adjustment. Yeah. One thing I have to get used to with the ebony whistle, again, is the narrower pressure range. Um, takes little breath control and always, for me, takes a little practice. I can't move immediately from one whistle to another because they all respond a little differently. I'm used to one thing and then try to do the same thing on another. It doesn't work. You've got to use different pressures or different breath control. So that's, but I, I, it's got a pleasant tone. I like, I like the tone. With flutes, my friend John Folsom plays flutes, and yes. uh, he has a baroque flute, and uh, then he has uh, the, what the Irish use. That flute, if you had one that was made in its prime, it would be in B flat anyway. But I mean, B flat, not like clarinet is tuned in B flat, but it would be. It would not be a four forty because that was not how things were tuned. A four forty wasn't was adopted tuned. till the nineteen thirties, right? Uh, London Philharmonic pitch was around A452 up till then. Different, different orchestras or different organs were tuned to different pitches, but different frequencies. All of what they called A was different all over the place. And this made it almost impossible for the poor instrument makers who would be making, say, oboes, and he would make oboes for this orchestra. And of course, there's only two oboe players there, so he's already made all the oboes he can sell there. The, the guys from the country next door want to order an oboe. He makes them the same oboe. They say, oh, this is way too flat. We need it sharper. So he had to really remake the whole oboe. It's like the, the, the whole positions, everything were different. This was driving them nuts. So they came up with the idea, gee, let's standardize tuning so that the poor instrument makers can when they're making them for the Paris guys, or the guys in London, or the guys in Munich, or in Vienna, whoever, they're all play, they're all made to the same pitch standard. So that's A440 became a uh, uh, a convenience uh, in the 1930s. Before that, you get antique instruments, and they're just tuned to whatever they're tuned to, and they're not necessarily. Some of them will can play them with A440 and. Some of them you can't. You'll see a lot of old flutes and so on that'll be marked LP, which means low pitch. Can't play them with a modern with modern uh, players. You could play them with a. If everybody was playing in low pitch, fine. There are there are plenty of orchestras and reproducers. There are guys playing Baroque music. A four fifteen became a convenient one. It's not necessarily Baroque pitch, but it was a a pitch that. Some makers started making instruments. They said, "Well, if they were in lower pitch, let's use the A415." And say so they more or less borrowed that as a standard as well because they were all over the map. Thing that I would posit 
is uh, my experiences teaching recorders and teaching clarinets to um, elementary kids uh -huh. is that I, I came up with the loose lips, tight lips yes. Uh, yes. instruction to get them to understand what embouchure was. And it was very interesting. I took it around to all the different uh, musical instruments that they play in band and orchestra. And on the recorder, uh, the first class got a half step dis difference from tightening their embouchure, uh -huh, making yeah. dimples, I told them. Right. And the flute players, I got them to do it on just the mouthpiece. The flute and clarinet, we want to warm up the, 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 head, yeah. the head first. And uh, we actually got a three-tone difference, three-note difference with uh, embouchure. Yeah, but they'd already yeah. played for a year because in yeah. third grade they learn recorders and they're learning to read music, really. They don't tell them. But <laughs> yeah. And then when they get to the uh, fourth grade, then they can pick out what instrument they want. And Sean is always talking about bore being very important. Yeah. And um, I'll say no more. Well, that's, that's all, all interesting stuff. These things work or don't work depending on an interplay of a lot of different factors, and that's what you're you're talking about. Length, exactly. The tone. Whole tone, whole size, the diameter of the holes themselves. Exactly. Oh, and that was another thing. The sixth hole on this yes. is like twice the size of all the other whistles. Yeah. Now, if you'll notice, the bottom holes on these are this, we don't have another standard whistle, but they're quite a bit larger. Take it from me than most whistles. The only difference I notice on these, the, all the whole positions look about the same, except on the ebony whistle, the black hole appears, the second hole up, appears to be slightly lower, and therefore, um, because it is lower, it's a, it's a slightly smaller in diameter than the one on the, on this brown whistle, which is the holes higher. In order to be in tune, then well, it has right, to be bigger. Well, right now, the, the your whistle is higher up. So oh, it is. you know, almost want to take the heads off and, and hold the barrels. Well, there's the, there it is right at the same okay. length. Okay. There are, these instruments are both in D, but you can see the whole positions and so on are entirely different. And the whistle, to even though they play the same pitch, the whistle actually plays an octave higher than the... Than the, than the Bagpipe. So what about the bore? Well, some some the bore whistle. These these whistles are cylindrical. The pipe chanter is has a tapered bore, and so it's some bore. Also, the method of sound production. This has a reed, and this uses the fipple. This one, the, the the bagpipe has a much bigger bore. But then, by the time you get up to the top of the bagpipe, the bore is pretty small. Where in the whistle, the bore is the same here as it is up at the top. You can't really see it, but this little tiny hole that that's plugged into, oh, I can unplug it. You can see that's even flared out the top to fit the reed. The hole down inside is quite a bit smaller, and you can see the difference between that and this. So the bottom of the bagpipe has a much bigger bore, and the top of it has a very small bore. So okay, so tapered a, bore. A tapered or cone-shaped, conical or cone-shaped bore. And that has a great deal to do with sound production. It does indeed. It has to do with how they work. And the, the, that's the thing that generates the sound here. When the whistle, when you blow through it, the, the wind splits down at a little blade, and that's what makes the thing sound. This is it makes this wood, that, which is actually a wood, it's from a giant grass called Arundodonax or cane, we call it reed, giant reed. The, the timber of the giant reed is shaved so that the two halves vibrate against each other. It's like the, the buzzer in a whoopee cushion. On the clarinet, which has a reed, yes. made out of the same material that you're yes. talking about, uh, and the sax also is made with a rounded done eggs. Yes. What happens is the reed is vibrating. Yes. And the vibration is necessary that we talked about the sound wave sawing line form. That's necessary in the sound production. Mm -hmm. um, on the trumpet, however, the brass that's yes. going through, uh, you know, you can pay up to fifty to uh, probably three thousand dollars for a mouthpiece. Yes. For a French horn yeah. or, or a trumpet or a trombone, whatever. Um, the lips are, are the, the vibrating. Reed. They're the reed. reed. They call it a lip reed. In fact, the lip, the lips. Are...
the camera. thing that, that causes it to vibrate or the sound to be produced is in both cases is a type of reed in, in the in the clarinets all bolger bagpipes it's a wood or a timber that is shaved and made so that it vibrates either against another piece of wood or a piece of plastic or something that that it slaps against a couple different kinds of reeds whereas in the all the brasses the lips in are, are held inside of a circular cup or with the mouthpiece is called and that portion of your lips inside the mouthpiece <laughs> makes the that basically that's what you do is is it makes the raspberry sound that that uh, and that that sound, the vibration of that is <laughs> yes. Excuse you. Of course, strings are vibrated with either a bow or they're plucked with your fingers or a pick, and that's a different kind of vibration. And, the, and with its stringed instruments, it's the body of the instrument that causes the the uh, that gives the sound. The string alone, just sitting out on a board or in free air, doesn't have much sound. So it takes a wooden body to amplify that sound and give the characteristic sound of say guitar, or violin and so on and so forth. And uh, so you have reeds and um, and then there are free reeds like in a harmonicas and accordions and they don't, that reed does not slap against itself or another thing, it swings through a very tiny opening back and forth and it's called a free reed because it's it's doesn't vibrate against anything, but it causes a vibration of the air due to the very fast passage of the reed through the opening. Well, in the intervening time, the whistles grew up. It went to uh, from to this is the same D whistle, only an octave lower. So humongous whistles. These are. Two different makers, both of them, I think, both very fine whistles, very fine sound. They're my two favorite whistles at this point. Uh, they both have kind of their use. This one is by Ronaldo Rayburn up in Ash Ashland, Oregon, and this is by Misha Somerville called MK Whistle, and it's from Glasgow, Scotland. So, they, but they got a different kind of sound. The this has a very ra more round of flute-like tone. And listen to the slight difference you might hear here. I'm going to seal the whistle first. rounded and this has a rounder fuller tone but they're both very pleasant one might work for one kind of tune better than another or depending on your choice so it's always good to have more than one whistle around as most whistle players seem to <laughs> and uh, Mr. Bagpipes here just can't be happy with one he's got about 50 so yeah, 55. Like 55, that. last count. Yeah. Yeah. Last count. Five more. 55 bagpipes. And here, and uh, all to make the, the cats cringe and the dogs howl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, well anyway, this is the, this is the old, uh, I'll play, play something on this. So we'll play the, the Tower Polka. This is an old Dennis Brooks tune. Uh, it's a popular in cork, I think.
Remember that? Yeah, I'm used yeah. to hear that. The played on this whistle, the effect is slightly different. Which takes more air, Tim. This takes more air. Mm -hmm. And this is easier to support the second octave. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was kind of a win-win. I like the rounder sound. I like the ease of the second octave. Sometimes this requires more speed of air in the second octave. Some people say pressure. It's not so much pressure. It's how fast you're blowing. And uh, it takes more speed. And you really have to be able to support that with the diaphragm. This one. It almost plays itself. This one you got to think about it and work at it a little yeah. more. But again, it has a it has a nice tone that if you're if it's if it's the tone you're looking for, then that's that's the go-to whistle. And it's, it is a little edgier. Um, it's not. I think there probably would be could be said to be about the same apparent volume. One's not really louder than the other. They can both be heard very well in a session, but they do have slightly different different. Well hand me that one and we'll play saddle a pony. Okay. Let's try saddle a pony. <laughs> Different versions. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. of course. But, <laughs> and then the dog enough. came and helped. Yeah, the dog will come and help. But he's good. He's good at helping. This is, this is the new dog. Velcro, we call him. Actually, his name is Merlin, but I call him Velcro Dog. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's play something else for the heck of it. Oh, uh, what do you got, Mike? I don't know. Do the skyboat song. Oh no. Let's, let's do. Let's do. Uh, off to California. Oh no. Oh wait a minute. Similar in volume, I think. Uh -huh. yeah. And try this one and see what you think of the difference. You give me give me your uh, opinion. Of, this is lighter by quite a ways. Except then the second octave, it seems to require a lot more support than that one. I it does. To me. To you, huh? To me. It's now, just, uh, that, that might be that one. <laughs> my old whistle had a hell of I would have a hell of a time sometimes mm -hmm. with the second octave. This one's been easier. Just plays in This is a new whistle to me. My old one, 
it was much more difficult, but it was a little louder too. It's a very interesting, yeah. interesting thing to see the differences between these beasts. So that's the low <laughs> whistle. Now whistles are made in a lot of other pitches, like what, I what have, price are these? No, the the one from Glasgow is. That is now four hundred. They were three hundred up until. Oh wow. You know, the price of success is the prices go up. Well, of when, when, when something yeah, is, right, is right, successful, right. the price goes up. And piano, if, for example, there's no difference between a B-flat and an A-sharp, but in truth, to a fiddle player, if you're playing in the key of, of uh, B-flat, the B-flat is slightly different in pitch than an A-sharp. They're not the same note. And so that is equal temperament. Piano became a compromise. Organs so on. Uh, um, there were different methods of tuning them so that they would, um, in different keys, would sound better. A, a compromise was, is the equal temperament that we know on the piano today, or instruments of that sort. That um, Whereas a flute and whistle can be tuned in equal temperament in order to be able to play in a bunch of different keys, but flutes and whistles, the way in Irish, Traditional music are primarily being played in D, G, and the relative minors, and so to make pure fifths, that, that the fifths are, are, are really purely in tune, and, that, and especially with a bagpipe, so that each note tunes with a drone of D, or, or is, doesn't sound off, they, the tunings are, are, are adjusted to be what they call just intonation, that the ratios in cycles per second between notes are in, are in whole number intervals, they're not weird intervals, but there are the relationship in them that mathematically is pure, and this is thought to give a, a cleaner sound, a, a very in tune, just in tuned instrument playing in the key of D. If you tried to play it in the key of F, say for example, it would, you could probably play it by half holding and so on, but if it was just tuned, the scale would be off in the key of F and it would sound horrible in F where it sounds fine in D, where an equal tuned instrument sounds kind of semi-mediocre in every key. Mm -hmm. <laughs>